I've never been as excited for Elden Ring as I am right now. The new trailer looks absolutely amazing, and the fact that we only have to wait until January makes it even better. The thing about Elden Ring though, is that it's not meant to be just another Dark Souls by another name. It seeks to change up the whole formula by, among other aspects, offer a complete open world as opposed to the branching worlds of the Dark Souls series. And this takes us to what I want to discuss in this video, namely, can Elden Ring live up to Dark Souls? And if it can, then how? Well, let's get to it, and begin with what made Dark Souls so awesome. I think we can summarize the near-perfect game design of Dark Souls in a few concepts. World building and layout, the aspect of dying and difficulty, enemy placement, and main character motivation. Dark Souls was so unique because it told you so little. You found yourself in this hellhole of a world where you begin as an insignificant actor to becoming more powerful than demigods. Dark Souls' world is just that. Dark. From the bleak undead burg to the swamp of Blytown and the tomb of giants, Dark Souls is ridden with death and the cycle of death. But there is beauty here too. The beauty of a lone resting place away from danger, or of a sun narrowly sending its warm rays through thick clouds, intensifying the need for praising it. Perhaps most of all, we're given a world of unfathomable contrasts of a beautiful but dangerous kingdom above the depravity below, and a world existing so far underneath that the only depth remaining is a never-ending sea of black. This world is made even better by its design, by the way the player is allowed to maneuver it. It is no exaggeration that we can indeed make our way all the way from the bottom of the earth to the city on top of the mountains in one go, with only a single, cinematic and in-universe dynamic loading screen dividing up the journey. This is in part made possible by how the world revolves around itself with branching paths, but ingeniously placed shortcuts make it that much easier to get around once you've actually traveled there once before. There's always a wow moment when you unlock a shortcut, and chances are you'll play through the game several times before you unlock them all, unless you really take your time or look them up, of course. In a sense, Dark Souls is an open world game, but it's more of a linear open world. There are only so many paths from one place to another, and you'll likely always be walking the same ones to reach your destinations. With Elden Ring moving to an open world system, this carefully placed and managed world layout will likely change somewhat. In most open world titles, the vast plains are often beautiful but empty, and you rarely have to think of your immediate surroundings when meeting an enemy or a point of interest. This obviously applies to games like Skyrim and The Witcher, but think of Breath of the Wild for a moment. I think Breath of the Wild modeled Dark Souls in several ways, above all in its atmosphere of a post-apocalyptic world. Now these are two very different games in many ways, but there's a massive difference even between the open world in Breath of the Wild and its more linear dungeons, so to speak, where you have to maneuver walls and the like. Seeing as this is from software, however, I do hope it's fair to assume that we're not getting a run-of-the-mill sandbox here, i.e. no towers with zones of control to occupy and a thousand boring side missions and such. But we are nevertheless likely to come across activities. And this is where the danger lies, I think, because it might be amazing for the genre to mix things up a bit by adding uncertainty to the world with either randomized events or other things of that nature, but it might also remove, despite all the hardship, some of that fairness and predictability of Dark Souls, which gives the player some measure of control. Of course though, Elden Ring will offer both an open world and dungeons, which likely will rely on many of the same design concepts as Dark Souls so there's no reason to fear the loss of the design genius of the developers. Indeed, the inclusion of a full open world may give back some of that magical feeling we got in Dark Souls 1, and to a certain extent in Dark Souls 2, where the worlds are almost completely without loading screens, at least between a main Firelink shrine and the rest of the game. So I do remain hopeful that From Software will manage this transition, but desperately hope they'll stick the landing and create a world as memorable and as open for genuine exploration and eureka moments as Dark Souls. Now let's go to the difficulty aspect and the concept of dying. A major aspect of Dark Souls is dying, whether you like it or not. The merciless difficulty of the game is meant to stop your progress, returning you to the last bonfire that you rested at. But dying is more than that. Dying prevents you from getting invaded by other players, or asking other players for help. Dying can be used as shortcuts to indeed return to the bonfire if you so wished, 
and can therefore be used as a traveling tool. Dying is meant as a tool which makes you try again until you succeed, and this in turn, the ability to overcome your challenges and actually make it, is a big part of the appeal of the series. It is all tied to the bonfires though, and so these spawn points are located strategically throughout the game, often hidden from view so as to reward the players that explore. There's a big question on how this will all be done to the same great effect in Elden Ring, but as explored in Vatividia's video, we may now see the introduction of movable bonfires, which means that players can pack them up and take it with them on their journey. This is still only speculation of course, and is mainly taken from this shot, which shows the player resting by a bonfire. They might be movable, or they might simply be located at different places in the world, or we might even see a combination. Maybe they're movable in the open world, but strategically located somewhere in the dungeons, but it remains to be seen. Either way, the open world can bring some problems here. If you should forget to say, pack your bonfire up, it might be an extremely long time between your last rest and your death, and who knows what that might mean for loss of progress. If they do remain static though, one would assume they are placed so close to each other that it would make sense gameplay and lore-wise. Perhaps they would actually look something like they do in Shadow of the Colossus, where you can save at these massive temple-like rocks which are scattered across the world. In any case, it's fair to say that the move to an open world will bring with it changes in how bonfires are used, but we'll wait to see how it's actually implemented. The same goes for enemy placement. In Dark Souls, if you're an experienced player, knowing where the enemies are is a given. Enemies generally don't move around unless you're targeting you, and unless it's your first playthrough, you probably have tactics for drawing them out or dealing with them so as to avoid death. Dark Souls' approach is of course a very unnatural one, but it works extremely well as a game design concept. The enemy is right where it's always been, it will always be there. It might be hard to kill, it might be standing in a specific spot just to mess with you, but at least you know where it is, so you can plan how to deal with it. In Elden Ring though, we will be seeing enemies that are moving, and with the addition of stealth options or enemies traveling in groups, add a whole new world of possibilities. But in open world games, we're fairly used to possibilities. Dark Souls is indeed the game which stands out, so I think it's up to Elden Ring to show how an open world game can indeed improve upon the Dark Souls formula. If they manage to make enemy placements more dynamic and challenging, but retain that sense of fairness, I'm all for it. Again though, we are likely to see a split between the open world and the dungeons here, where the dungeons may act a lot more like the areas in Dark Souls. This is all completely speculation of course, but it is fun to think about. Now let's move to the last point of this video, namely character motivation and place in the world. It's perhaps a cliche now, but that's only because it's so perfect. Every Dark Souls game has you play as, essentially, a lowly, worthless and near-death person with the odds stacked unbelievably against you. And yet, you overcome. You overcome to restore a previous state of the world, to save it from everlasting darkness and return it to some form of normalcy, only to realize that the world will eventually return to the hellish state in which you currently reside. You're a nobody, but a nobody who after an extreme struggle becomes the one. There is something so scary and yet so beautifully dark about this, because even though the world is hopeless, and it turns out your actions are ultimately also just going to lead to the exact same world, there is something beautiful about the journey, about the idea of overcoming the odds simply so the world can live again, if only for an age. Elden Ring, I believe, seems to change up this formula somewhat. According to Miyazaki, you will now have another form of motivation, a motivation based on reclaiming what's yours, retaking a throne or a seat of power which originally was supposed to be yours. Now this is not inherently a bad setup, indeed it's even more of a cliche than Dark Souls is. It's the story of a returning hero. What I'm afraid of though, is that this sort of character motivation will seem too familiar, that it might be too lighthearted in a way compared to the beautiful hopelessness of Dark Souls. We know very little if nothing of the story though, so again, this is only speculation. With George R.R. R. Martin writing the story and many of the characters, there's little reason in being fearful of a generic or normal type of story. I hope for the best, and that Elden Ring will manage to tell a tale which is as dark, but as solemnly beautiful as the one in Dark Souls. One reason I'm thinking this way is partially because of what this new background might mean for the bosses, might mean for all the characters of Elden Ring. In Dark Souls, the bosses and enemies seemed like they were specifically there to keep the world corrupted and dark, 
and to uphold a state of the world in which the darkness prevailed, ultimately leading to everlasting darkness. Darkness, darkness, darkness. In Elden Ring though, this motivation is currently unknown. I'm extremely excited to experience why the bosses and enemies act the way they do, what has happened to this world, and why the villains wish to maintain its current state. I think Elden Ring is the first from software game since Dark Souls which has the potential to really create a new genre, and to fully expand on the From Software universe of games. Combining an open world with the dungeons of Dark Souls is daring, but if there's one developer I trust, it has to be From Software. I for one cannot wait for Elden Ring, and I'm so excited to be back in a game where I know absolutely nothing, and where exploration is everything. Thank you so much for watching friends, as always, if you enjoyed the video, I'd be honored if you'd consider signing up for my Patreon, it would really go a long way. Other than that, I'd love it if you left a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you next time. Cheers!